what do you see as the most pressing issue facing the planet these days? Well, clearly the most pressing issue facing the planet these days is humanity. I mean, for every other species in the world, the only real serious environmental problem is humans. For humans, we're looking around for, well, what's the environmental problem? We're the problem. So if we look at it from the point of view of what's the most pressing issue for the planet, it's humanity. If, you were, if the question is, what is the most pressing issue for humanity? It's how do you live on a planet without destroying it? If you have all the power that we have, the power to expand, the power to consume, power to grow across the face of the planet as we've had and control resources and use resources and energy. How do you do that without destroying the environment that's feeding you? So how do you assess the forces at play here? Um, you've got, you've got, obviously you've got uh, forces that, that want this, this to be dealt with in a totally different manner than the way it's being dealt with now. So how would you, how would you describe the forces that at work here? Well, I, I think the fundamental forces are um, natural uh, growth and consumption of, of any species. If we look, if you look at any species and you let it go into a, a bountiful habitat, it'll just start gobbling it up and growing. And so that's what we, that's what humanity has done. But in nature, there are always these feedback loops, including predators, some way to control. A, a species that wants to grow. Every species exists because it wants to grow. So wanting to grow is not innately wrong, but the, 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 but the counter force to that is that there's no such thing as infinite growth on a, on a finite planet or in any finite habitat. And so growth always stops. Now in nature that works with feedbacks and, and prey and predators and, and natural limitations. So the, so the question for humanity is, if we have no predators and we have nothing restraining our reproduction and our growth, are we going to be able to do it ourselves? And so far, the answer is no. We haven't been able to limit our growth, stop our growth. We've, uh, there are some cases where we have shown the ability to sort of mitigate our impact. But we're, we're, at the, we're in grade one or kindergarten as far as ecological management of ourselves. You know, one of the aspects of this project, uh, the catchphrase, is, is to promote the conscious evolution of our species. Because it seems to be exactly what you're saying. As an animal, all we're concerned with is, is, is reproduction, food, and shelter, ultimately. That's what everything is. Yeah. As long as we're the animal. But there's also a fourth aspect to humans that maybe animal, animal, animals don't have, which is what you're explaining. Earlier. Well, I, I, would say, I would say that... Um, yes, first of all, as, as animals, our instincts are normal to grow, to reproduce, to feed ourselves, to consume more, to be comfortable, to have shelter. All of these things are, are natural. Uh, but what is not sustainable in a natural system is infinite growth. So there's always something in the ecosystem that keeps the wolves from taking over the whole forest. Uh, if you eat all the deer, they die. the wolves start to die, and then the deer grow. But there's systems that keep the, the deer from taking over the forest. If, if there's too many deer, the wolves eat more, the wolves grow, etc. That's how it works in nature. So I would not, myself, I would not particularly say that humanity has a consciousness that's particularly higher necessarily than anything else in the animal kingdom. Uh, or plant kingdom for that matter. We don't really know. Our consciousness is a part of natural consciousness. The animals evolved on this planet. I mean, like we, we know, for example, that we're 99%, our DNA is 99% similar to a chimpanzee. So we have the, we grew up like everything else. Just a minute, let's, let's stop here for a minute. Do you want to have that dog stop barking? Do you, um, want, do you want that? Do you think we're going to catch that? Well, the, if the option is having the dog running around as exuberantly as she did before, I think yeah, you'd better leave we'll her. deal with we'll deal with that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Make this a little a bit of a medium shot, okay? So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So I guess what I was kind of referring to is that the fact that we do have this other aspect potentially, which maybe only Buddhists explore, maybe only really truly spiritual people explore, where we can actually overcome those animal parts of our natures. I don't know. I think we, we, we show at times ability to overcome pure instincts uh, of survival and, and, and say consumption to ourselves. We show compassion to each other. We show compassion to animals. 
Uh, we show compassion, you know, we, we, f we f see other people suffering and we feel that and, and we, sh we show uh, some graciousness in the world, we show decency to other people. So these are natural instincts as well. Now these instincts probably evolved, it's the same as our, our more greedy instincts. These instincts toward compassion, community and so forth evolved because they have survival value too. If you treat your surroundings well, if you treat your other community members well, and in fact if you treat the environment well, you will have a better chance of survival. So those instincts were natural too. So I don't particularly see those instincts as some kind of higher consciousness that only animals or only humans share that the animals don't share. I've seen compassion in other animals for example so that I don't assume that humans are the only animals that have compassion or have feelings from others or that sort of thing. We have some things that other animals do not have which is the power to control fire, for example, and transform resources and, and, and uh, uh, cultivate the world and take over, you know, consume every habitat on the planet. So we've developed these, these tools uh, and it's, it's sort of like in evolution, um, certain, certain power relationships are sort of like like politics, the first one past the bar gets everything. Right? So once, once primates, our ancestors, uh, were able to control fire, nothing else stood a chance. So our entire evolution since really the day that, that early uh, hu uh, human primates controlled fire and had used stones as tools, nothing else had a chance. And you, you go back and you look at uh, we ask the question, you know, where's the missing link between the chimpanzee, which is 99% us, and us? Where's the missing link? The missing link is genocide. Our ancestors <laughs> killed everything that, that could compete with it. And so uh, we, we, we have to, for me, it helps to see who we are in, in an evolutionary, in a natural sense, before we try and run around and figure out how we're going to solve all our problems. We have to really get a grasp on sort of where we came from. Yeah, so that's kind of what I was getting at. Since we have no natural way of keeping us in check, it has to come from us, right? We have to come well, yeah, see, and this is precisely the point here, is because humans have so much power on the, in the world that we ourselves have to control our own growth. Most animals don't have to worry about that. The deer in the forest don't have to worry about controlling their growth because if there's too many deer, the wolves eat them. If there's too many wolves, they, they eat all the deer and they starve to death. So they don't have to worry about controlling their numbers. Nature does it for them. Well, nature will do it for us too, but nature is not sentimental. And it won't necessarily be a pretty picture if, if nature controls our population, for example, and our consumption. But if we do it, we have an opportunity here to actually do something that in, in, in evolution we don't see a lot, which is a species takes over a habitat, recognizes that, stops growing, and lives peacefully and lives well with what the habitat can provide. The earth can provide a lot, a tremendous a lot, but it can't provide jet travel for everybody and, and uh, hors d'oeuvres from around the world and, and wines from around the world for seven billion people and travel and holidays and, and all these things that, that the, the, the wealthy of, our, of the human society enjoy. The, the, we're killing the planet or we're killing the biosphere um, providing that for one-sixth of, of humanity. So th the idea that we could even provide that for seven billion people, much less a, 10 or 11 billion people, is, is, is not biophysically possible. So there is an opportunity here for humanity to recognize that it has to be its own natural limit because we don't have any other natural limit. You know, it's funny, like we teach our children all the time, I and mean, most parents, most conscious, serious parents, they'll teach their children that there's limits. The parents, how many parents have told their kids, hey, you can't just have everything you want. Just because you want something doesn't mean you're going to get it. You have to work for things and there's, there's rules in this world. And yet, in our society, in our culture, we act as if that's not true. The grown-ups act like, a, like spoiled three-year-olds. Well, if I want it, I can get it. You know, I've got three billion dollars. No, I'm, next year I'm going to have six billion dollars. You know, I've got a jet. Next year I'm going to have a bigger jet. You know, I'm going to have my own island. I'm, you know, a bigger yacht. 
and the, and and then they they actually propose the idea that there are no limits, and you hear this all the time from the economic types, from from the from the growth advocates, you know there's no limits to human ingenuity and blah blah blah. Well, newsflash, there are limits to human ingenuity. There's limits to any anything's ingenuity, and and humans have a tremendous amount of power, but we do not have the power to rewrite the laws of the universe or rewrite the biophysical laws of nature or the biosphere that we live in. So maybe I'd like to go back to the early Greenpeace days, and maybe if you could sit, tell, tell how it sort of developed into, into what's become a, you know, a worldwide sort of... Well, you know, if we go back to the 1960s and 70s when, when Greenpeace was just beginning to evolve in, in Vancouver, for example. Um, at that time, ecology and environment were not household words. If, if you would have asked on a, on a college campus in 1969 what ecology was, if you ask 100 students on a co in university campus, you probably wouldn't have got more than half a dozen decent answers. It, it was not a subject that people knew much about. We were starting to become aware of the environment. Rachel Carson had written her groundbreaking book, Silent Spring. We were starting to be aware that, that of our impact in the environment, and and we had there were there were groups such as the the Sierra Club that were trying to establish and protect parks for human in, for human enjoyment and pleasure and hiking and that sort of thing, but there had not yet been this real sense of understanding that the ecology of Earth is its own process, its own set of rules, its own set of processes, its own set of habits and, and ways that it works, and that humans could not necessarily control it, that we weren't in control of life on Earth. It's almost like if you go back to the 16th century, 15, 16th and 17th century, the Copernican Revolution, Copernicus and Kepler and, and Galileo and the others explained to humanity that the Earth was not the center of the universe, and this changed everything, and it, it, it challenged the church's interpretation of cosmology and so forth. Well, ecology does the same thing in the 20th century and the 21st century. Ecology teaches us that humanity is not the center of life on the planet. Life on the planet is not here just for us. We have this sort of lingering Judeo-Christian idea that everything is here for us and that we're here to to use everything to get off to some other place where we're going to be rewarded for all our our, our goodness um, this of course is a complete mythology but the problem is is that it continues to linger and that we have this idea and we operate as if this whole world is here for us but here's the here's the news flash that ecology brings to us the whole world isn't here for us. The whole world is ha quite happy without us, for that matter. So these ideas were just becoming uh, a part of our culture in the late 1960s and 1970s. And an ecology movement was almost like wanting to be born. And this was the time that Greenpeace got started in Vancouver. And Greenpeace certainly wasn't the first group of people who had ecological values and ecological ideas. but we sort of combined the the tactics of the peace movement, nonviolent direct action, uh, Gandhi uh, direct action, um, with kind of street 50s, 60s street theater, theatrics, and media awareness. Um, Marshall, we were all reading Marshall McLuhan. We were aware of the power of the media. We were aware of that you could use the media to tell stories. So. Our philosophy at that time was to change the world, you have to tell a better story. And you t you, the stories that we told about ecology, we felt had to be based on truth. You, you know, nothing wrong with fiction, but you know, what we wanted to talk about our place, humans place in, in the ec ecology of the earth. So we, we, we relied on good science and, and um, we wanted to bring about an ecological movement. We had seen the power of the civil rights movement and the peace movement and the women's movement and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and so forth. Uh, and we felt that what was missing was an ecology movement. So we set out to do these actions, uh, the whale campaign, the seal campaign, wolves, forestry campaigns and so forth, 
to sort of awaken this ecological awareness and consciousness in, in humanity. Um, and I would have to say, looking back on it now, 40 years later, it was successful. We were successful. We, we weren't the only ones doing this, of course, by the way, and, and there were many others. There were Friends of the Earth and the Sierra Club and many other uh, environmental groups, the Wilderness Committee right here in Vancouver, SPEC, which SPEC was an environmental group in Vancouver before Greenpeace, and our first office was actually in the SPEC office. So there were others working on this, but because of the whale campaign and the seal campaign, they were just, they were so popular around the world that Greenpeace became sort of the iconic uh, direct action environmental group, and still to this day, still is. So c can you describe a personal experience where it really sort of, uh, uh, where the philosophy became an emotional attachment to, to, the, to the, 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 the movement? Yeah, well, you know, for me personally, I felt this, uh, I felt looking out as a young as a young man, say in the late 1960s, I'm looking out the world and I'm I'm beginning to get this environmental awareness. I'm beginning to see, wow, this growing, you know. And, and at that time, there were only about three, only about three billion people on the planet. The population's doubled since then. And the environmental problems have quadrupled. But at that time, we were we were already beginning to see, and I was beginning to see. The human growth paradigm was heading for a fall. And, and now I was trained in the sciences, so I had some kind of scientific background enough to understand this in, in, a, in a scientific way. But I was also understanding this just purely instinctively by observation, because all the beautiful places that we used to love as children were being turned into parking lots and fast food hamburger stands and stuff, and it doesn't, take, it doesn't take much to project this into the future and go, where are we going, and what are we doing, and why are we doing this? Why are we destroying the most beautiful things we know to create these ugly parking lots? Um, and so, when we, so, so that was the consciousness that I was bringing into it uh, in, in the early Greenpeace days. Now, on our campaigns, when we went out to, to blockade the, the whaling ships or to stop the seal hunters uh, or to stop the loggers in the forest, we also had the opportunity to go into nature, out into the ocean or whatever, and, and actually experience the thing that we loved, which was wildness and nature, and nature for its own right, in its own self. And not just nature for humans to explore, but nature as it is, living in, in nature, evolving, changing, interacting. Uh, so the time we spent with whales on the ocean, the time we spent with seals, the birds, the sea life, sharks, fish, you know, uh, to, to be immersed in nature uh, was really the payoff. It was for me. And I, I remember, for example, being, being out on the ocean in the during the whale campaigns, you know, day after day, up and down in the little waves rolling in, rolling on, the sun comes up, goes down, the stars, and, you, and being immersed in nature and seeing things like the flying fish, the dolphins in front of the boat. I mean, day in, day out, dolphins playing in front of our boat. Uh, the flying fish, you know, the sharks would come around. We'd look down through the water and see this big, huge blue shark. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! You know, and, and uh, uh, well, one day uh, 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 this big sunfish came up to the edge of our boat, and and we were we were just bobbing around in the water, and this big sunfish came up, and we all jump in the water and we're swimming around. This fish, this big, huge fish, which was about as big as we were, just comes up to us, you know, curious as curious about us as we are about the, about the fish. And in a way, this these kind of experiences just made us realize that all of our wonder about nature and, all, and our love for nature was certainly not misplaced. That, that in fact, if, if you allow it, if you allow nature to get close to you, it will love you back. Uh, other things in nature are just as curious about us as we are. You know, when animals, you know, like come up to us, they're not just always looking for something. They're not just always looking for. Sometimes they're just curious. Sometimes they're just they just want to know about us, like we want to know about them. There's this reciprocity 
between us as individuals and as individual humans and nature and it's going on all the time and one of the problems with our culture is this our culture gets in the way of that reciprocity I mean, I was just uh, reading something this morning from, from somebody who was writing about being in New York City and realizing they were looking around and where, from where they were standing they could not see one living thing other than humans. Not a blade of grass, you know, not a tree, nothing. And so we've created these human environments in which we've killed everything else. We've created a desert in the middle of our cities with nothing there but humans and and, and human, uh, human systems, and um, otherwise they're deserts. And so we've, we've created this barrier between ourselves and nature and, and blocked this reciprocity that's constantly going on. We hear nature, we hear the birds singing, but the birds hear us. You know, we, f we feel the wind, you know, the, the, the wind is moved and shaped by us. There's this going on all the time. and, and um, most animals, uh, most creatures, and most, in fact, all living things live inside this reciprocity constantly. And so do we, but we don't notice it as much as, as, as we should because we've created these artificial or human systems between us and nature. And, and gadgets and uh, TVs yeah, and interfaces. Social media. We yeah. This whole little, uh, the illusional world of, um, of interaction. And, uh, so how would you assess 40, 50 years later? I mean, what's your, what, how do you feel? Like, like, I find it's usually pretty powerful to hear how people feel. Uh, other than, the facts are always in, are, are interesting as well, but how do you feel, you, what, what do you feel you, has happened, has changed? In those well, it, certainly in 40 years since the beginning of Greenpeace, for example, uh, or since the early environmental movement even in the, in the 60, 1960s, so in the last ha half a century, 50 years, um, the environmental challenge facing humanity has not gotten better. It's gotten worse. So with now, we, we have made some progress in, in some things, a certain consciousness and awareness about things that ha have improved. But um, the depletion of the forest and the, and the depletion of the species uh, uh, and growing deserts and so forth, and, and CO2 in the atmosphere, all of these indicators have gotten worse. So with all of our awareness about ecology, with our ecology movement, our you know, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, all the other environmental groups that have evolved, all of the ministers of environment, you know, all of the sustainability coordinators for all of the corporations all add up to no solution. We have we are losing ground environmentally every day. Now I do believe that can turn around. In fact, I know it will turn around. My, my, my greatest fear is that it won't turn around because of human uh, wisdom. It'll turn around because you know, we'll ru finally run into the limits of nature and she'll just, she'll dictate the terms. And as I've said before, nature's not sentimental. You know, I love nature, and, but I know that, that the natural world doesn't care how I die. <laughs> so if, if I die starving to death somewhere, you know, uh, nature doesn't care, uh, nor should it. But the point is, I care how I die, and I care how you die, and I, I care how we live, and, and I don't want any, any of my human brethren and sisters to, to suffer. So I would like us to solve this problem of limits with our wisdom, with our intelligence. But <laughs> unfortunately, um, our society is just being pushed so hard by greed and consumption and like I said, you know, people have a billion dollars, they want two billion, you know, if they're a millionaire, they want, they want, to, they want to be a billionaire. When they're a billionaire, they want more. Uh, this drive to possess and to hoard and to control um, tends to drive right now our culture. And so how quickly can we turn this around? My fear, my feelings about this, my concern is that so far, I'm not convinced that, that our collective wisdom is more powerful than our collective greed. I'm not sure it's not. I mean, maybe, maybe our wisdom will catch up and surpass and, and defeat our collective greed and avarice, but um, 
what do we have that tells us this is going to happen this way? I, you know, uh, I don't know. You know, I interviewed uh, Andrew Weaver uh, a few weeks back, and uh, he yeah. was saying that even if we stop everything now, the ice, ice caps are going to melt. Yeah. It's, just, it's just going to happen. Uh, the, 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 the temperatures are going to change enough that we're going to lose like, a huge percentage of the species on the planet. It's going to be a different world. No matter what. Years. No matter what, even we stop now. Yeah. Which is pretty, you know, it's pretty... And we're not stopping. No. And we're not going exactly. to. So, yeah, so, so uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, I go out, you know, I can, you can, we can go out not far from Vancouver and go out into the hills and go right out here in, 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 into the coastal range and you can be far away from human civilization and you can be with giant trees and, and uh, forests full of... Uh, uh, you know, deer and wolves and bears and, and uh, um, warblers in the trees and vireos and and you can feel like goodness gracious the the the, the strength and resilience and patience of those living systems will will be fine and they will outlive you know human greed and ignorance. Um, and so on the one hand, you know, when I'm in really, when I am in the natural world and feel embedded in the natural world, I, I think things are going to be fine. <laughs> but I find, it, I find it terribly troubling and sad and, uh, that, that humanity is destroying that natural world at, at such a rate. Uh, and just out of stupidity, out of ignorance, out of greed, out of fear. I mean, what are, what are people afraid of? So afraid of that, you know, as rich as we are, as well as we live, what is it that drives people to have more and more, you know, a bigger house, more cars, bigger boat, more boats, more airplanes? What drives all of this? It's fear. Are, are people happier because, you know, they, they sold their $500 million yacht and or, or, you know, and got a billion dollar yacht, you know, are, are they happier? Are they better off? You know, um, and in most cases, no. I mean, look at, look at the, uh, look at the, in, in, the, in the rich world in, in, in Europe and North America where, where we consume so, such out of proportion number of resources per person, uh, where we have this tremendous wealth, where we all live fairly comfortable lives. Um, Look at the depression. Look at the look at the mental breakdown. Look at the frustration. Look at the kids in the street who have nowhere to go but join gangs. Uh, look at the home. You know. You know. In our, in in these in these rich cultures, in a culture like Vancouver, where most people have wonderful, wealthy lives, that we allow thousands of our brothers and sisters to literally starve in the streets. Oh. What, what kind of culture is this? What kind of civilization is this? If, if, if you know, if we, if this was, if this was ten thousand years ago, and, and we were living in some watershed and, and with, in a community, and you know, are we going to let, you know, people starve to death in our community? You know, people used to take care of each other. So to me, it comes back to this sort of sense of, of common decency, um, community. Uh, taking care of each other, uh, literally taking care of each other. This idea that we, that we live and survive as individuals, that, it, that, that you know what, I'm going to send my kid to school and he's going to get some education so that he can compete with every other, you know, seven billion human beings on the planet and it's everyone for themselves out there. I'm not going to teach my children that. That's not what makes society work. What makes society work is people who care about each other and take care of each other. And if somebody's hungry, you feed them. If somebody's sick, you, you help them out. You make them well. You know, you, and, and if, if somebody's old and, and, and can't cross the street or can't lift their bags, you do it for them. This is what makes us human, you know. Not not this hoarding and 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 consumption and getting richer and getting rich and then getting richer and then getting way richer. It's it, to me, it's um, it's criminal and it's it's stupid for one thing, but it's criminal because it, it you know the the hoarding and the consumption uh, and the craziness around money and wealth. Um, it's it's not 
it's not just a neutral thing. It actually hurts the earth and it hurts other people. And, uh, and uh, the, there's this old idea that uh, if, we, if we grow the economy, that we're gonna, that a growing economy supposedly lifts all boats, this kind of theory. But it's not true. The, the percentage of people who are, are starving to death is not lower now than it was 2,000 years ago in the first century, you know, during the Roman Empire. They still have the elite wealthy, just like the pharaohs in Egypt. It hasn't, hasn't changed much in 5,000 years. You have the, a few wealthy people. You have a kind of middle class, you know, doing very, very well. And then you have the rest mass of humanity. You have 80% of humanity really struggling. And then you have about half of humanity literally starving to death. <laughs> And we haven't changed those we haven't changed those balances much at all in in the last five thousand years. So what is this progress we talk about? You know, it's not really progress for for humanity or for the earth, of course. Uh, the rich do get richer, you know, and and um, I suppose you know they can call that progress. But in the meantime, look what we've done to the planet. We're warming up the planet, destroying the species. Rivers are polluted, CO2 in the atmosphere, and on and on and all the indicators of all the health of the planet is worse. Deserts are growing, the forests are shrinking. Go do the math. So this is going to have to turn around. And uh, you know, my feeling about it is that I'm not sure how it's going to work out. I really want, I really would love to think and to believe and to see humanity doing this. Uh, with its collective wisdom and, and its common decency toward each other and towards the rest of the living things on the planet. But I, I'm not sure that it's not going to sort itself out in, in nature's own way, which is going to end up being, you know, starvation, uh, massive changes of the, of, of the uh, uh, climate, and that we will meet our, uh, our limits uh, in, in ways that are, are painful. I hate to see it go that way, but um, you know, I tell I tell my own children and anybody who will listen to me, you know, th that the key to survival now, going into the future for humanity, it's about community. It's about fi finding a place where you can live and take care of that place and grow food and protect that environment, protect the bounty of nature, uh, and build community and look after each other. And it's not necessarily your generation, and I, I would say this to my own children, it's not necessarily your generation that are going to make that a success. It might be 10 generations down the road. But these are the, these are the skills we have to learn. Grow food, take care of each other, and protect your environment, protect the, protect the ecological bounty of the environment that you live in. If you can do that, you're, you have a chance of, of sustaining yourself. But if we, if we sell it all off for trinkets, we're done for. You know, I wonder if part of the reason that you're saying about, about New York, like uh, where a lot of decisions are made, I think, I wonder if some of these people, if they actually were forced to, to be out in nature, like be out in, a, in an old growth rainforest for, for a week and, and experience what they've, what they've never experienced, something that's always a commodity to them or, or, or an abstract concept. Or an opportunity to make more money. Right. I wonder if the, the actual experience of that, I, th I wonder if that would change people. Uh, I, I know that um, we were talking to Sephora and, and she was saying that, um, you know, for her when she was in, in Ontario, she, she heard what was going on here in the, in the, the clay quad and felt compelled to be here. But until she actually was in the rainforest and, uh, and felt, felt, was actually experiencing it, uh, it, was, it was more of a concept. And, and, and then once you experience that, it sort of became a, a passion. And I wonder if that would make a difference for these people. I think that it's almost self, it's self-perpetuating cities because the more it, it separates you more from nature, and it creates its own world. And its own world needs that growth. It needs to have new gadgets, new distractions. So it, it, it's it's almost like it's a it's a feeder feeder system within itself. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Cities cities do um, feed off of themselves, and and the separation from nature feeds off of itself, and. People that live in cities have, who have less and less contact with things other than human uh, don't have that awareness and consciousness. And many people grow up today in, in, in cities, purely human environments, 
and hardly ever interact with anything that's not a, not human. And they play games on machines and they watch TV and they're watching a screen all the time. And um, they live in, in you know, they're, all of their instincts are firing, you know, all their synapses are firing, all their, you know, they're still living creatures, uh, but there's, the things that are stimulating them are all created by humans. And so, there, you know, TV programs and electronic games and images and, and so forth. So we're creating a, this own little world. But here's the problem. That own little world isn't feeding itself. We're feeding ourselves by mining nature, you know, we're, we're by, you know, mining the soils, using up the water, depleting the oceans of fish. And so this little game we're playing, and our, you know, our computer games and our televisions, um, that world is not sustainable. And in order to sustain that world, you need this natural world. But that consciousness isn't there because we're, because people are, creating a world that actually um, hides the natural world from them. So yeah, it does, f it does feed itself. Cities do feed themselves. And I'm not sure, you know, like, yes, I do believe that any time that anybody spends, really spends in the natural world, um, <laughs> will help. There's no question about it. Like, being close to nature helps. But there's also kind of this tourism mentality that, oh, I'll go and, you know, I'll spend my two weeks in nature and now I love nature and, and then I'm back, you know, selling, selling it to, to, to the highest bidder, you know. Um, so there's another step besides just being what we call, you know, like going into the natural world and spending some time in nature, is, is this understanding that we are nature. This understanding that we have never left the natural world, uh, that every every breath we take is our reciprocity with nature, is this is, is our interaction. Every time we eat anything <laughs> edible, that's nature going into our body. And there's this cycle going on all the time, and um, time in nature helps that. Like it, being in the forest, being on the water, being in the ocean. Well, where do people go for their holidays? When, you know, people make millions of dollars in, uh, living in the city, and then when they go on holidays, where they want to go to the cabin on the lake. They want to go skiing at the cabin in the mountains. They want to go to a beach somewhere. They want to take their shoes off and actually have their bare f feel sand coming up through their toes. Why? I, I, think, there's, I think we are, as a, as a culture, I think we are starved. For nature even when we don't know it. I think we're traumatized by missing something we don't even know what we're missing. We're missing that experience that, that our ancestors grew up. Now imagine, you know, our primate ancestors and human ancestors grew up for millions of years in the forest, in the lap of nature, and that everything we are, everything that, that in our cells that, that has evolved remembers that natural experience and yet our intellect doesn't necessarily remember it because our intellect intellect might have been shaped by a, a a world in a city looking at video screens and computer screens and so our consciousness our intellectual consciousness doesn't recognize what our body recognizes which is we miss being in nature. So when we go on holiday, where do we go? We go to the lake, we go to the beach, we go to the mountains, we go somewhere where we can feel nature again. And why do we do that? Because we are starved for it. And I think a lot of the trauma that is experienced in, in modern uh, cultures, electronic cultures, modern technol technological cultures, a lot of the trauma is the trauma of missing it's like missing a parent. It's like not having a parent. It's like not having the full family that provided us with security for, for millions of years of evolution. And so I, I, you know, just as if, you know, if someone's a young child who grows up and loses a parent or both parents, that child will be traumatized by that. And, and that child will have many challenges to overcome by not having that sense of a, of a family, 
uh, that looks after you and protects you. If you grow up with love, if you grow up with with parents and family around you who love you and protect you, you grow up with confidence. You grow up feeling that the world's just fine and you're going to be okay. And it's the same about growing up in nature. If you grow up in a bountiful environment that has plenty to eat, you're not trying to hoard. You know, why do we, what's this instinct to hoard is because we've just, we're destroying the bountiful environments that used to feed us. And so I think this is traumatizing to us as individuals and, and as a culture. It's traumatizing our culture. We're crazy. We're, we're going crazy. And then we're trying to hoard more and more and we think, you know, you cannot hoard enough to be sustainable. Sustainability has to do with living on nature's flow, nature's bountiful flow. If you can live within nature's bountiful flow, you're sustainable. You can't stuff enough food in your basement or a million basements to be sustainable. There's no sustainable hoarding. Sustainability is living within the processes of nature and the, and the production of food, which is the embodiment of energy. Cool. You have a lot of great, uh, great ways of encapsulating this. Just a few more, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so back in the early days, uh, when, when you when you decided, because the, the whole Occupy movement, uh, do you find that, what do you think of the whole Occupy movement? Well, you know, the, the, the Occupy Wall Street movement is one of the most interesting things that has happened in, in, in recent memory, politically, around the world. Now, I, rem I, I just was traveling, and I was uh, traveling with my family. I was meeting, I, I visited some family in Ireland. I was traveling with my own family in, in, uh, in Europe, in, on the continent in, in uh, France and uh, in Netherlands and elsewhere. And um, everywhere we went, every city we went to had an occupation and with the we are the 99% and the whole thing. Now, I have not seen that kind of global consciousness in action since the 1960s. And it has not existed. And, and something, there are a couple of things that are very interesting to me about this. First of all, it's not easy to create a global social movement. And it takes, you know, more than just, it's not something somebody sits down and figures out. It's, it, these things go in cycles. But, but the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement is, is one of these global movements that's just caught on everywhere. Now, here's something that's also interesting about that. Uh, compared, say, for example, to Greenpeace, which, which started 40 years ago here in Vancouver. The Occupy Wall Street movement came out of a Vancouver publication that's published out of a basement on 7th Avenue by Adbusters and Kali Lassen and his, and his gang over there in a, in a basement on 7th Avenue. Now, that's interesting to me. So you had Greenpeace 40 years ago, and you have Ad, Ad, Adbusters, by the way, is one of the great one of the one of the great things that Vancouver has produced, as well as Greenpeace. Uh, but here, so Adbusters has run this uh, runs this story about Occupy Wall Street, and boom, it catches on all around the world. So I think it's fascinating simply because it's a social movement, and you know that a social movement is important when it just catches on naturally. The women's movement's an example. The women's movement was a no-brainer. Of course we should have gender equality, you know, as well as racial equality and every other kind of equality. Of course we should have gender equality. But it, it, it wasn't, the, the women's movement that, that happened in the 1970s, for example, didn't start in the 1970s, but women had been on the street for 200 years. So how, or, or more, probably 2,000 years, <laughs> the women's movement's probably, it's certainly as old as patriarchy, but the point is that there are times in social, cultural evolution when the time is right for something to happen. And of course, when the women's movement happened in the 1970s, the time was definitely right for that to happen, and it happened. Same with the environmental movement and Greenpeace in, in the 1970s, and the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s and so forth. Um, so it seems like the world has recognized that the time has come when we have to reevaluate our economic system. And an economic system that enriches the richest people on the planet and impoverishes the poorest people on the planet is not an equitable economic system. It's a fraud. Right? And this fraud that's being perpetrated upon society by a few very, very, very wealthy people, and then of course all their tag-along rich <laughs> enablers um, is a fraud and, it, and, and it's an economic system you know based on hoarding wealth not on 
anything remotely sustainable, much less social equity. So society is recognizing this and so you know we have a banking system and when the we have a for example we have a capitalist system that says um, you know uh, we're all free and the market will determine what happens create your business if you're smart and successful you'll make lots of money if you if you create the wrong thing nobody wants it you will perish and yet when the banks go broke we don't let them perish you know the banks and then the government are in cahoots, so the banks and the governments conspire to take our money, our tax money, and pay the richest people on the planet uh, and bail them out. You know, nobody bails me out or you out when we're in trouble financially. So the fact that this is unjust is so painfully obvious, so obvious all around the world, that when this Occupy Wall Street movement happened, uh, it happened all over the world. And so I've been touring around and in Paris there's an Occupy, you know, group and in in uh, Dublin, <laughs> and in, you know, Cork, you know, everywhere you go in the world, we were in Galway, in Galway, there they are, you know. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's really interesting and I think what it shows to me, it tells me that there's really something afoot here in, so, in terms of a social change movement that's happening that's going to have an impact. Uh, and of course the status quo, the, 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 the bankers and the wealthy capitalists who uh, have done so well uh, are going to protect themselves and they're going to fight back with everything they have. They're going to mock and ridicule uh, this movement. But it's a, social, it's a powerful social movement. Vancouver is really a hot spot for all sorts of uh, cool ideas and cool people and, and innovative thinkers. What, why do you think that is? What is it about this? Well, yeah, it's very interesting the question of wh why is Vancouver such a, um, why is Vancouver a place where so many innovative ideas have emerged through Vancouver into the world? Um, and there are other places like that. I mean, Vienna was like that at, at a time, and, and uh, Amsterdam was like that at a time, and, and uh, other, other centers of, uh, of humanity have, have served that kind of role. But what is it about Vancouver? One, I think, yes, nature, uh, you can't get away from nature in Vancouver because we're surrounded by water, for one thing, and mountains on one side, and, and uh, so you're always, in a sense, you're always embedded in, in the natural world. There's also a, a kind of Canadian uh, um, sort of sense of wilderness, that wilderness is part of our culture and part of, part of the Canadian culture. Uh, there, that feeling also exists kind of in the western U.S. I mean there's a lot of Americans uh, who came to, to Canada and live in Vancouver and th this kind of hybrid culture which is sort of Canadian uh, with a lot of American influence but also a tremendous amount of Asian influence, um, Chinese, East Indian um, influence Japanese, influence of Japanese community of Steveston of course and, and, and that Japanese influence has had a huge influence. Buddhism uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Vancouver. So Vancouver really is a cosmopolitan melting pot culturally and it's in the middle of this beautiful natural place uh, and it has a vibrant intellectual community I think partially because of that. Uh, multiculturalism is, is, is good in that sense that it sort of creates this, this intellectualism. Where, where you don't have social changes, where you have places where everybody th thinks alike and everybody sort of acts as if they're all alike and, and then you're not ever going to have cultural change in places like that where, pe you know, people, is, where society is so structured that you don't have change. Vancouver's not like that. Vancouver's a place where, you know, there's, there's no normal in Vancouver. You know, there's different pockets of communities all over and people speak different languages and have different ideas about things. So Vancouver has this very rich sort of intellectual and cultural atmosphere in a very beautiful natural setting. So it seems reasonable that uh, great ideas would come out. Or people want to live in a place like Vancouver because it is because it is beautiful. Of course the more people that come here <laughs> the less beautiful it becomes and we become more like a big big city. And this is what's happening in Vancouver. You know we're grow you know Vancouver's been growing at two or three percent per year that but that means we're we're doubling every 30 years in size so you know we're up to two million now so by the time I you know in another 30 years, we're going to be four, and then we're, be, you know, in my children's lifetime, we're going to be eight million people in Vancouver. So, it's there's a there's a challenge there. I mean, it's not going to stay like this. It's beautiful now, but it's not going to stay like this if we allow it to grow to eight million people in the Lower Mainland.
Was that how tough was the decision for simple to make to have simple disobedience be a part of your the, the tactic? Oh, it was just obvious to us. All, those of us, you know, in the, in the early days of Greenpeace, um, all of us were involved in the in the peace movement, and civil disobedience was a part of the peace movement and the civil rights movement and the women's movement and everything. So, it it was it was a no brainer that that uh, social change requires action, uh, and you know we believed that. That action had to be nonviolent action. Uh, we weren't talking about violent revolution. We were talking about nonviolent consciousness revolution. And um, but consciousness revolution requires somebody acting it out. The change. So uh, people burning their draft cards, or Gandhi marching to the sea and making salt, and. Uh, you know, women marching in the street and civil rights, you know, Rosa Parks sitting on the bus, all of these things, you have to act out the, the cultural change. And um, that's what we were doing. And we wanted a cultural change around issues of ecology. And um, so we had to find ways to express that. So we did these campaigns. Do you, uh, do you have a, a strong sense of, I'd imagine being a part of any movement that uh, actually has shaped the world, uh, must give you a, a sense of purpose, uh, of, of being a part of purpose and, and uh, living purpose. Do you feel like you're living, you've lived your purpose and are living your purpose? Uh, I have many, many purposes. I, you, know, I'm in my, you know, I have children. There's a purpose, you know, so raising my children and, and providing, you know, a family context for my children and having a relationship with my wife and having a relationship with my community and all of these things are important to me. Um, I've been involved in environmental activism not because I was looking for something to do. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a writer. Uh, I do, um, you know, to me that's part of my purpose. I, I, I enjoy communications, working in the media, talking, you know, discussing uh, uh, about the, the issues that are, that are interesting and important, and, uh, investigating human consciousness and, and so forth, all of these things. Uh, but I've been involved in environmental activism, you know, really not as a career, but as uh, it just seems so important to me that if we don't learn this, I grew up feeling this. I felt this way when I was 18 years old. If we don't learn how to live on this planet in a smart way, we're going to really screw up, and we're going to we're going to lose the opportunity that we have before us. Which humanity could live on this planet for a long, long time, many more millions of years, but not the way we're going about it. So it always seemed important to me that we wake up uh, and not allow the lowest form of greed and corruption and avarice and stupidity drive our culture. Uh, so that's why, I, that's why I get involved in the environmental issues I get involved in, because it's, to me it's important that, that our culture learn to live with higher values other than accumulating more stuff which seems to drive so much of, of our culture. So how can people affect change? As in well, I think, pe I think the way to affect change, I think it, it, it definitely has to start um, with waking up all the time, like all, always reminding ourselves to be awake and to see what's going on in the world, be aware, and be aware that we're constantly processing the input from the world. So kind of have the light on all the time, but that's just the beginning of it. It's not about, it's not a sort of narcissistic, uh, subjective, entertaining ourselves with consciousness. That's just the beginning. I think to affect change, you have to actually uh, engage constantly in society and and with with the natural world too. But. To change society, you have to engage with society all the time. So I, I think the key to, to social change is 
not too complex, it's society. It's being a part of society. It's being in community, working in your community all the time. And there is never a day in, that goes by where every person does not have the opportunity to help make the, the, their community, the, their neighborhood, their community, their, their, their city, their nation a better place. Not a day goes by when someone could not contribute to, to their culture and their society and making it a, a, a more egalitarian, more just, more fair, more livable culture. And we do that, again, through common decency. It doesn't take much. You can be, you can be poor and still help somebody else. You can be, you can have nothing and still help somebody else. But mainly what people need is somebody else to care about them somebody else to help them and, you know it's it's not that hard to help so to me that's my idea of social change is my idea of social change is to be aware have consciousness all the time and have the light on have, have, have be be reminding oneself all the time to stay awake and alert and then use that awareness use that consciousness to contribute to your family to your friends to the person who's sitting next to you um, to your government if you can, you know, to your city council. Um, open a door for somebody, you know. Smile at somebody. Treat somebody nicely who's feeling depressed. You know, uh, there's just a million ways to contribute. But it, the, so it's sort of, to me, it's not like just because you work for an environmental group or you work for a social justice group that therefore you're contributing. You know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe all you're doing is holding down a job and making yourself feel better. You know, maybe, maybe it's easier to contribute any time you walk down the street and the people you run into. I mean, the fact that we allow homelessness and hunger and we, we allow children on our streets that have no place to go, uh, to me, that's, that's crazy. That's insane. How can we call ourselves a sophisticated culture? We're not. We're, we're barbaric in that sense. I always ask everybody how they would envision an ideal world. Be a, this, is, this is paradise. Right? It, it, this could be the ideal world. So how would you envision it? Well, I have to tell you, I, I don't, I'm not sure that it matters what the ideal world is, what I think the ideal world is. Um, I can imagine a world of humans, a, a, a human world, humans living simply and benignly on the planet, um, enjoying the simple pleasures that the earth has to offer and and being genuinely uh, sustainable and being able to endure their communities uh, by staying small and modest and simple and, and carrying on you know um, but I'm not sure that sort of our visions of idealizing life in any way is important or matters because what really matters is dealing with life as it is, which is not idealized. Uh, it's life, real life uh, is awkward and clumsy and filled with conflict and moments of joy and pleasure. And, and to me, um, m even more important than the idealized life is being awake in this world that the miracle is here all the time. I mean, to me, it was a, if I just remind myself, like, what an amazing world I live in with stuff growing and feeding each other, and everything in nature dying and growing and living and feeding off each other and all of this and evolving and consciousness evolving and, and all the, the amazing animals and the birds and the trees and all of this stuff that's going on, the miracle's there all the time. So to me, the idealized life is the awake life, living awake. Uh, and I don't think that you can live awake uh, if your consciousness is just about gaining more stuff or gaining more wealth or gaining more power in the world. Uh, what I witness, what I see is the people that live this kind of hoarding lifestyle uh, become less and less awake and more and more just... And they're, you know, perhaps they're pursuing some idealized life where they have so much wealth and money and power that they never want for anything and they're, they're infinitely happy, maybe, they're, but they're seeking this ideal rather than being awake in the world in which they're already there. So 
to me, the more awake you are, the less stuff you need. You, know, you can look out. You can look out the window, which is actually better than television. But you have to notice. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. You're very okay. welcome.